Hi, thank you so much for coming tonight for Sadie's talk. Woo um, <laughs> I pulled a Ginny there. Um, Sadie Barnett's multimedia practice illuminates her family history as it mirrors a collective history of, of repression and resistance in the United States. The last born of the last born, and hence the youngest of her generation, Barnett holds a long and deep fascination with the personal and political value of kin. Barnett's adept materialization of the archive rises above a static reverence for the past. By inserting herself into the telling, she offers a history that is alive. Her drawings, photographs, and installations collapse time and expand possibilities. Political and social structures are a jumping off point for the work, but they are not the final destination. Her use of abstraction, glitter, and the fantastical summons another dimension of, human, of the human experience and imagination. Recent projects include um, the reclama reclamation of, five, of a 500-page FBI surveillance file amassed on her father during his time with the Black Panther Party and her interactive re-imaging re of his bar, San Francisco's very first black-owned gay bar. Hello. Um, Barnett has a BFA from Cal Arts and an MFA from the University of California, San Diego. She has been awarded grants and residencies by the Studio Museum in Harlem, Art Matters, Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, the Headland Center for the Arts, and the Carmago Foundation in France. She has enjoyed solo shows in the following public institutions, ICA Los Angeles, the Lab and the Museum of the African Diaspora, San Francisco, um, MCA San Diego, the Manetti Shrem Museum, UC Davis, the Benton Museum of Art at Pomona College, and the Kitchen in New York. Her work is in many permanent collections, including the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Brooklyn Museum, Perez Art Museum, Guggenheim Museum, Oakland Museum of California, Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Walker Art Center, as well as a permanent site-specific commission at the Los Angeles International Airport, forthcoming in 2024. <laughs> The first monograph on the artist's work, Legacy and Legend, is available now. She lives and works in Oakland, California, and is represented by Jessica Silverman. Please help me welcome um, Sadie Barnett. Y'all, so much for the introduction and the warm welcome to your community here. Um, how are you guys doing tonight? All right. It feels like it feels like there's some energy in here. So that probably means that y'all like study together and have each other's back or in a, in a process together. And I really appreciate you welcoming me into uh, your space. And I hope to just kind of share what I do with y'all. Um, I always want to start by taking a deep, a deep breath, and also by thanking those that came before me, both on this land, before me in this profession, my ancestors and my family. And just like real basic background, I am from Oakland, California. I use photography, sculpture, installation, couches, wallpaper, kind of whatever I need to, to tell these family stories as it relates to local and, global, local and global histories, but also, honestly, like just as a way of witnessing and grounding and moving through the world and making sense of the world. So my plan is to speak for like about 50 minutes about a few different projects that connect my wide-ranging practice, and I hope that you guys will make yourself comfortable if you need to like move around the space or get some water or run to the bathroom, feel like free and comfortable to kind of be in your body, even though you're probably like mostly going to be in your head um, listening to this talk, but just, you know, check in with yourself and I'll try to do the same up here. I feel like there's this thing that happens when you're standing at a podium that kind of presents this sense of authority or assuredness. And while I do acknowledge that I have some experience, and a strong sense of authorship. I also really enter my, enter my practice with a deep sense of not knowing 
and of guessing and trying and learning. And so I just want to take like that little edge off of being up here on a podium. Um, it's very much both of those like ways of being and those personas. And the last thing that I'll mention as kind of introductory is that talking about the work is of course not the work itself. It points to the work, circles in and around and gets close to the work, but it's my hope that there are elements of the work that can't be explained or described that exist beyond language, before language, and must be felt, seen, and experienced. But I do hope to use this talk and talking about the work as sort of an entry point and a welcoming to get into the practice. So let's start with this piece, which is fairly recent. I start with this because it's a self-portrait, essentially, but also it shows how in my universe of signs and symbols and materials, I might arrive at a self-portrait that looks not so much at myself, but rather who I'm in relation to. So this piece is titled Family Tree 2. It is comprised of inkjet prints of family photos and cell phone pictures. There's collages, stickers, spray paint, rhinestones, and then there are these um, spray paint and pencil drawings. And literally the piece is structured around like the names in my patriarchal family lineage. So starting with Cassandra's great great granddaughter, going down to like my grandparents and then Uncle Rodney's daughter and really just like thinking about who we are in relation to where we come from and who we're in relation to. So it literally is like a deconstructed family tree and all of these kind of familial gathering moments, you know, a wedding, a birthday cake. Um, and so that kind of is it a grounding entry point for how I'm, you know, sort of a, approaching this practice that has so much to do with family. But one of the most extensive projects that I've worked on relating to my family is this investigation that I call the FBI project. Um, sometimes projects just name themselves after you've like been doing it for a while. You're like, it's, it's the FBI project. Um, so my family filed a Freedom of Information Act request, or a FOIA as it's known, in 2011. And after almost five years of back and forth with the FBI, we finally were able to have our constitutional right fulfilled to receive this 500 page surveillance file masked on my father during his time with the Black Panthers here in Southern California and fighting for Angela Davis's freedom up in the Bay Area. Um, we had no idea what to expect, like 10 pages, one page, um, but when we received this 500 page surveillance file, I really um, felt, and I'll just like read this statement that you can also maybe see here. Um, this is from the book, and I feel like if I just read this, you will, you will know where I was at when I started this project. So, when I first studied the 500 page FBI surveillance file amassed on my father, Rodney Barnett, I thought, damn, I'm lucky he is alive, that he lived to tell that I was born. My second thought was, make this art, make this do something. I needed to turn this dossier of repression into a testimonial for my father, for the story, for the struggle. Trusting in my rigorous yet playful aesthetic of minimalism, restraint, and color, I started making collages and drawings that appropriated the official documents. I wanted to reclaim them and make them live in my world. I did not do this to put a pretty bow on the history of the 1960s, but to rage pink light over the entire ever-expanding fuckery of how cute humans keep behaving. So to kind of locate you in the historical moment that this work draws from, you can see in this diptych here of my father, the first image is 1966 and then in 1968. 
So he was drafted and sent to Vietnam. He returned and joined the anti-war movement and then the Black Panther Party and um, founded the Compton chapter of the party in 1968. Um, it's also important to me that these images are family photos. Um, you know, they're not taken by a journalist. Um, they're actually taken by my father's niece, who was just a teenager at the time, in my father's sister's living room in Compton. So I scanned these at like really high resolution and enlarged them to almost life size, and they hang on this wallpaper that I created out of stamps from within the like officious notations, stamps, and signatures from the file. Um, and this, you know, image of like the U.S. military to the People's Army also really um, speaks to something that happens after you know basically every war in the history of our country is that a generation comes home from having lost you know, friends and limbs and nearly lost their lives and you know, isn't, hasn't gained any more access to like, freedoms or liberty here in their own country. And so you'll, there's often like, an upsurge in political resistance and organizing um, as a response to you know, the lack of dignity that um, black and brown folks will face even after fighting in a war. Um, here's a detail of the wallpaper. You can see like the top corner, there's a stamp that says racial int sect. Um, and so like just how standardized and institutionalized it was, this like racial profiling um, that was happening under J. Edgar Hoover um, was really intense and I'm not gonna like go super in depth into the history of COINTELPRO and J. Edgar Hoover and the Black Panthers, but I will recommend some books that do. But um, basically the form that this project has taken since 2020 has been these large scale graphite drawings. So this exhibition was organized around 12 drawings and then this sculpture in the centerpiece. Um, sculpture is also called centerpiece. It's like this coffee table that might be, you know, at my auntie's house or someone's grandma's house. It's got this black vase of roses that sits on top of it. And then the bottom is inlaid walnut, wood, and plexiglass and has these metal flake security cameras poking out from underneath it. Um, and I'm really thinking here about surveillance and domestic space and these like supposedly private spaces that we know are you know not impervious to the lens of state surveillance and that kind of um, blurring between what's supposed to be private and what is not um, and then for the drawings um, you know since I've been working with this source material for a while um, I really started letting the work become bigger, literally. So they, these drawings are like uh, four feet by five feet high, and they really um, hold a lot of weight and claim space, underscoring that this, pro this is a project of reclamation and restoration. The pages are tonally inverted, so like whatever was black in the files is now white. Um, you know, kind of suggesting like this further transmutation from the original source and intent. Also people say they feel like carbon copies or something like that. And these are made with powdered graphite, like a really heavy, thick, deep kind of working of the graphite into the paper. Um, so wherever you're seeing white is paper and wherever you're seeing dark is the graphite. And then I'll say the thing that everyone says when they're doing a presentation, which is that the projector is a little darker and more contrasty. But if you imagine like seeing this in real life, basically instead of like it being dark and also glowing, they're sort of the opposite. They kind of absorb light, but also have like a metallic sheen to the surface texture. Um, and there's some cloudiness and variation, which you don't really see here. 
and another thing that you would do if you were in front of these is like get up really close to it to see if it's really a drawing um, because it's very meticulously handmade in a way that conceals its handmadeness um, in like a really inefficient but I find interesting way. Um, so I'll just run through some of the some of the drawings, how they operate, and what they what the files themselves talk about. So this is basically a list of informants, and I'm spray painting on some of these drawings after they're completed, which is terrifying um, and sometimes horrible. Um, but when it works out, it works out well because the graphite like has this really controlled feeling to it and the spray paint feels much more um, kind of unpredictable and as gestural as I kind of allow things to be. Um, but it's still like a gesture but not a super direct gesture because the spray can is itself like this kind of you know, in between, so it's less gestural than maybe like a hand, you know, paintbrush or like a slashing mark. I always felt like instead of like ripping the documents or burning the documents, like kind of delicately placing these like pink annotations would be much more insidious um, and much more like disturbing to the ghost of J. Edgar Hoover. Um, so, and also thinking about spray paint as like my generation of like this kind of 80s baby hip hop, you know, kid growing up in Oakland, like it, it felt like to address these documents from the 60s, you know, I would do it with this like 80s baby kind of material um, intervention. And uh, just here's a, a detail. So yeah, I will like read this quote. Betty Metzger, who wrote a really interesting book that maybe we'll have time to talk about later, um, was talking about the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover's COINTELPRO, which stands for Counterintelligence Program at that time. J. Edgar Hoover was weirdly the director of the FBI for like almost 50 years, which is you know not that usual in a democracy. And so many like really important moments of time unfolded under this like authoritarian and clandestine rule of J. Edgar Hoover or the FBI. But Betty Metzger says that, um, quote, the overall impression and directives written by Hoover, other headquarter officials and local FBI officials was that the FBI thought of black Americans as falling into two categories, black people who should be spied on by the FBI and black people who should spy on other black people for the FBI. So that really kind of sums up, um, you know, what I found in the research as far as just like the unbelievable lengths and details that the FBI was going through to surveil like at one point every black student at Swarthmore, um, regardless of any like political affiliation or activity. Um, and I can go on and on about <laughs> that and it's like there's many ways to talk about the work and so I don't want to get too far into like that but just know that if you are hungry to learn more terrifying things about J. Edgar Hoover they're available. Um, so another intervention is these uh, holographic vinyl collage elements which I felt like um, in real life you know they're like these shifting colors and textures that really feels like a type of technology unto itself. So maybe like a, a counter surveillance or some type of restorative technology. It feels very um, like high tech to have this like glittering um, fields within this like really cloudy black and white space. Um, and then I also added roses to these documents, thinking about roses as like a way to mourn 
um, to honor, to memorialize, to add life, to suggest evidence of the domestic and rituals of care. I feel like public opinion has shifted a lot in the last like even decade or 15 years about the Black Power Movement and the Panthers, although like there's still not a full you know, understanding or teaching of the, his the actual history. Um, but there really hasn't been any like actual repair, you know, people even with as high of a profile as like Mumia Abu Jamal are still incarcerated. Um, so I think in some ways of these drawings as kind of like a spell cast for healing and repair and if nothing else, they're like an evidence of a really fierce love. Um, and this one, the roses are kind of growing out of this like list of former members. Um, who were like probably assassinated. And then you can see in this detail like of the COINTELPRO um, stamp that's like pixelated because when I received this information it was 2015 and I actually received CD-ROMs from the FBI, which was weird. Um, <laughs> it's like a very particular moment. Um, and so the in information was all digital and had been digitized, which made it easy to work with and like to share amongst my family and to test out different ideas, but also like definitely made me think about the capabilities of digital surveillance today and just how infinitely much more intense and invasive it is um, than this time. And then the roses kind of have their own like smooth feel so they kind of exist in a different world. And then some pages are like almost completely redacted, which I also think is interesting and important like what's not there these roses feel almost like a wallpaper like an old fading wallpaper and again thinking about domestic spaces and where these things are really playing out and what's actually at stake which is always family and in this page it's like a very small amount of information it just says on June 15th, 1972, Rodney Barnett was observed embarking on American Airlines Flight 474 in the company of Angela Davis. This flight was en route from San Francisco to Chicago, observation by special agents of the FBI. Um, it's like such a small moment, but it feels almost like a photograph to me, just in how it's like captured in amber this moment to then be reading like 50 years later. Um, Hello Kitty also seemed like an appropriate weapon to deploy in this situation. I don't know, and this one I think of it as like this little like Hello Kitty's people's army just like buzzing around and like scrambling the matrix. Um, detail. And then this was the only image in the file. Um, it looked exactly like the quality of like a political poster or something, just because it had been photocopied so many times. And thinking about like this, you know, image of my father, this mugshot, how a mugshot functions to like instantly kind of, you know, criminalize and dehumanize someone, and just imagining this like on hundreds of FBI desks. And then I thought like. By me drawing this, is there something that can happen in that process? Like, can the hand-drawn copy become more real than the original? Um, can this like portrait of a father and a freedom fighter replace this mugshot and like become more more real? Um, and so then, these are like a few of the books that I would recommend if you're interested in learning more about like the kind of deeper than the you know facade of the leather jacket and like the f big names that we know like there's a very very intentional intersectional international politic um you know that was the backbone of the black black panther party there were over 60 social service programs some of which like we still see the benefits of like the reason we have food in schools, like free lunch programs, was, was co-opted from the Panthers. So, or like, I think we really have a lot to learn about how many women were involved. There's a lot of like unlearning that we have to do about like these sort of 
um, like archetype, flattened, two-dimensional characters that we have been like misled to believe the Panthers were. So I hope that that's kind of like the next, you know, phase. And I think that it is happening. A lot of like real scholarship and archival work being done to paint a larger picture. And then Betty Metzger wrote this amazing book about a group of citizens who broke into an FBI office um, and liberated documents, which is how anyone learned what J. Edgar Hoover was up to. So now I'm going to move on to a few other projects. This is from a show I did at my gallery last year, a couple years ago, called Inheritance. And I think of inheritance as like a gift as well as a responsibility. It's a birthright, but also a debt. So this exhibition, as with a lot of my practice, attends to the personal nature of these generational legacies to think about inflecting like the constant struggle of being a person and being a people with urgency, collapsing distinctions of past and present. And I make these rooms that are for magic, for possibility, for dreaming, spaces and objects that pay tribute to the moments of beauty and hospitality and togetherness that we manifest even amidst all that we are up against. So this is like a speaker stack, a couch, a wallpaper. These are the speaker stacks. They're um, part of this like home good series. And specifically I'm thinking about speakers as like tools for communi communication, amplification of culture. And they're painted with uh, like an automotive metal flake paint or what we call candy paint finishes that pay tribute to the car culture of my California upbringing and the generative act of creating something grand and monolithic out of something ordinary. So whether it be rims on a car, rhinestones on a manicure, or flourishes of home decor, to me these acts of adornment are the ways that we become ourselves, announce ourselves, and find each other. So, um, couches and other kind of everyday objects like cans or phones also get this glittering holographic treatment and they're literally like shining light on the magic within the mundane holding the living room as a common but sacred space and that photo above the couch is my auntie viv lounging on a couch that she like created all the like um, interior design. She was like really talented seamstress, sewer, um, and she like made these cushions and the couch. And to me, it's just really about her like, you know, showing off her work and also like at leisure in this space that she, you know, cared to make beautiful um, because of what it meant and who it was for and what it, you know, holds for a family. Um, and then also part of that exhibition are these uh, text compositions, which are drawings made up of text. This one is colored pencil on paper, and it's the word sister repeated, almost like becoming like a chain link fence, it's a detail. Um, so yeah, these graphic drawings that use only words, sometimes they're bold and simple, sometimes detailed and intricate. And these works try to fit the biggest concepts into the smallest amount of information, a kind of elegant economy for the grand and overwhelming everythingness of our social structures and resulting human experiences. They point to walk around and dance with ideas too big for language. Um, and then, This is a project that's very near and dear to my heart and also just like a wild child <laughs> of a project. Um, but it's the new Eagle Creek Saloon, which is a participatory installation that reimagines my father's bar, which was the first black owned gay bar in San Francisco. 
I built the glittering bar structure to glow somewhere between a monument and an altar, reanimating the bones of the Eagle Creek in an intergenerational revival. I didn't want to make a project about the bar, I needed to make a project that was the bar. Um, in 1990, my dad opened the New Eagle Creek Saloon to serve a multiracial gay community marginalized by the very racist profiling practices of San Francisco's queer bar scene at that time. Um, and my version of the bar is made of steel, plywood, walnut wood, brass, plexiglass, holographic upholstery, 12 bar stools, LED lights, metal flaked objects, plants, photographs, candles, crystals, one Whitney Houston record, one cowrie shell, and more. And Stephen fabricated the bar so he can tell you even more things that are in it. Um, this is a detail of like one of the side boxes. If you see like in this photo by the stools, this is like what's going on underneath. Uh, the bar top has photos of um, like past, you know, uh, patrons. My dad says members of the bar because it was more like a community center than like a business. But um, and the bar was located at 1884 Market Street. The original bar was really a space of celebration and resistance, hosting fundraisers for activist groups, honoring black holidays and heroes, participating in the historic Market Street vigils for those lost to AIDS. So there's other moments of um, my bar that feel more like an altar. Um, these are on the very far left, two of my dad's brothers who were really instrumental in helping him build out like the rebuild of the bar. My dad said that if it was gonna be the only black owned gay bar, it had to be like perfect and beautiful and very up to code. Um, so his brothers helped a lot with that, which I think is amazing that it was really like this family project. Um, and although the bar closed in 1993, its slogan embodies its legacy and the 90s. Um, the slogan is a friendly place with a funky base for every race. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is someone who I really learned about through the project that I was never able to meet, um, but this is just kind of one of the, like, the like, icons of the bar, one of like, the main characters of the bar, um, Sammy, aka Miss La Creek. And though they're no longer with us, they have definitely become like, um, you know, someone whose name we call a lot while working on this project. And I love that, like, this photograph with just like the chains and the nails and the look and the like camisole and it's just like so so good and so thank you Sammy. Um, another part of this project is really like introducing my dad's bar into the channels of existing queer histories because the name was not known it wasn't in the archives like as soon as I would tell people that I was engaging in this project, they would be like, oh, have you been to this archive or that archive? And I, you know, had to be like, it, it's not there. Like, that's why I'm doing this is because we're making its own archive. Like, the archives are not like the totality of <laughs> everything that has happened. There's holes and there's gaps and like, that's, you just sometimes have to make your own archive. Um, and also kind of trying to challenge what we think we can capture and knowing that there's always going to be other spaces and other names and other places that aren't known and documented. And so can we just hold names for like the unknown, hold space for the unknown and the unknowable, um, even as we like walk in the world that they made. Um, so this project has been hosted by a lot of different institutions, but really it operates as its own independent community space, gathering archival material, making friends, and providing new programming as it travels. So this is the homie Redwood Hill tending bar and serving magic. And really this is like what the bar is about, is about what happens when people come together. Um, so it's really not like a 
quiet honoring project. It's a party. It's all my friends and my dad's people. It's permission to dance and dream, to call the names of those lost and to see one another as we are in the glow of our own small moments of freedom. And just to like shout out some of the folks who have um, come through and brought like magic and content and history to the project. This is uh, the homie DJ Jahari with this like amazing Sylvester record. Um, there's a lot of opportunities within a project that's a bar, like to get into the vernacular of a bar. So this was for a program that we did at the lab in 2019. Um, the lab in San Francisco commissioned this project originally. And my friend Rashad Nubian was gonna be performing and they were like, you know, I don't want it to feel like an art announcement. I want it to feel like a party flyer, like, you know, neon pink night at the Eagle Creek or like Rashad, you know, like collabo, like party vibes. And so we made this like show announcement to feel much more like a party flyer and really getting into the vernacular of the bar. We also made like, coasters and matchbooks and t-shirts. It's kind of like limitless what you can do with the parameter of the bar. Um, and yeah, here's Rashad performing at Institute of Contemporary Art, not far from here. And then I'm gonna play this little um, time lapse just so you don't think that the bar just like descended on a moonbeam. Um, it was insane putting it together and through this like very labored making act, similarly to like working the graphite into the paper, it's like working this bar into existence. There was a lot that happened in that making. And then like people came and it became this whole other thing and had its whole own life film screenings and dance parties and um, it just like, I guess, you know, I always say that when we finished building it on like the first Saturday before we opened, it was like a sculpture and then as soon as people came, it was like a temple. Um, okay. Then there's a zine component that goes to it, so thinking about like other ways that information can travel and that you know archives can exist. Like my hope was just to like disseminate as many of these as possible, and that like someone comes across it and is like, oh, the Eagle Creek. Like I was there, and also in this like dream fantasy, they have like photographs that they will then get to me. But um, it's like these little, you know, like those flowers that you like a wishing puffy little dandelion flower just. Spreads everywhere, little Eagle Creek wishes. Um, and then the Studio Museum like did a, a project where they made a digital version, which was also cool because that can travel in its own way. This should be like a QR code, but you just have to like write it down. Um, and then also in 2019, we took the bar to Pride. That was like the second craziest day of like getting it. I mean, we knew originally that this might happen, and so we designed it to fit exactly on like a flatbed truck. My father's like the patrons of the bar demanded excitingly that my dad be you know participate in Pride because they did not see like black and brown and multiracial communities represented in Pride. Um, now I feel like we don't see like anything less than the biggest corporation represented in Pride, so we had like similar work to do in 2019. Um, but yeah, so we just kind of knew this was that we had to do this, it was gonna happen. Um, and there's a lot of like, <laughs> you know, just hilarious stories and also like, something I never mentioned but was really important, like when we rented the truck, they were like, they had a brand new truck and so it was like perfectly clean and white and just looked like straight out of my art practice, which was amazing. And then we had these magnets, like Eagle Creek magnets to cover up the like Hertz rental <laughs> sign. Um, and we had like this pink carpet and all the objects from the original installation. Like it felt really important to me to like maintain the integrity of the artwork, even though it was like that pride in the middle of a lot of chaos, um, but we had so much fun. 
it really felt like it was the sort of um, like culmination of all the events that we did at the lab, like a community really grew through the time that that project was up in that space and then everybody reunited in this kind of grand finale and so like people who might have known each other a few you know weeks or months before um, they would start like people would like meet at one event and then they would come together to the next event it was like a very um, cute phone numbers were exchanged <laughs> Just, um, and yeah it's like Dina Beard from the lab clapping who is just like such an amazing human and put so much into making this project happen. And then that's like uh, Miss December in the very back of the float with the like fro and the pink glasses. I think we had, you know, on the float basically people like eight months old to like almost 80 years old. Um, it was very intergenerational. That's DJ Emancipation, like DJing. Uh, we dance. This is my dad grabbing the mic. Um, and like directly behind him is Jamal Batts of the Black Aesthetic Collective, who also presents like a film programs within the project. I just love like the way they're like looking at my dad and how happy my dad is, and just like super just heart melty. But actually before he bought the bar, he worked at the bar for like six months to really learn how everything went. Um, which is actually an interesting story, like, you know, it wasn't that my dad had like this dream of owning a bar, thank you so much. Um, it was really because of like the indignity that him and his friends were met with when they were going out, when they were like looking fly and going out to this, you know, scene in San Francisco in like 70s, 80s. Um, and just being met with so much racism and disdain and indignity and like, um, you know, being asked for three forms of ID, their dress code being policed, being ignored at the bar, like everybody else is getting their drinks and you're not getting their drinks, you know, black bartenders and DJs were not being hired. And so my dad, um, it was like very well known in the community, like, there's nowhere to be, people were getting like in fights with bouncers or just like swearing to never go to a club again, people were having parties in their houses. Um, and so when the original Eagle Creek, before the new Eagle Creek, um, the guy who owned it was gonna be like moving on to something else and he, he was a white guy. He said, Rodney, like I think you should take over the bar. I really want like a black person to own this bar. It's you know really hard to get a new liquor license in San Francisco, so you kind of have to get like it passed on. And so my dad worked in the bar um, for a few months to learn how to do it, and then you know kind of just answered this call and was like, all right, yeah, I guess like this is what we need. We need a space where we can be together. Um, and so that was what, how he opened the bar. Um, Okay, so then the bar went to the kitchen in New York at the top of last year. Um, a lot of really fun, amazing collaborations came out of that experience. Um, one you will recognize because they are amazing and are in the room and in the building and in the program. Um, so Madison Moore curated like five different events over the course of the kitchen and really like turned up the heat and the fog machine and the lights um, and brought so much like scholarship and friends and community and ideas to that space that now we are besties mm -hmm. and um, like continue to be able to collaborate on this project and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Um, then the Black Aesthetic that I mentioned, um, super cool collective, they have a offering of like art films but also archival films, like this is um, footage from like Sylvester's 40th birthday party mm -hmm. and they just weave in all of these different kinds of like different entry points to thinking about like queer history and queer nightlife and they are also individually amazing, you know, writers and scholars in their own right. They have like three little books published, so I definitely recommend checking out their work. 
Um, and then we were able to do like panel talks, um, always like, you know, interview my dad and have a drink and just kind of get into it. Um, and then the last project that I wanted to talk about um, is on view now at SF MoMA and it works similarly but a little bit differently to other projects so I thought it might be nice to just kind of like offer what I've made most recently and um, like really what I'm currently looking at. So this installation is called Space Time. It consists of a, a window tint, this mural wall, and drawings. And really this piece is a flattening of different elements of this lexicon of symbols, memories, um, iconograph, like iconography that I've synthesized into being an art practice. So like Hello Kitty, cars, a gold chain, the cosmos, pizza. Um, and why I say it's a flattening is because it's literally all of these different images are printed on one photo wallpaper. And something about like just putting things on the same pictorial plane or the same material kind of equalizes them. So whether it's a historic family photo of my dad in a panther uniform or a random snapshot at a wedding, or a heat sensitive Polaroid of myself in the third grade, which is like that little thing. Um, all these things kind of become like equally important ways of trying to understand the world or remember the world or imagine the world or locate yourself in the world. No one piece of them is going to do it, but together it starts to paint this picture, a kind of elastic, slippery, modular way of viewing reality or existence. And then there's also like these individual rhinestones that are applied on top of the photo mural. So it does then become a little 3D as well. Uh, this is image of like contemporary dad. I don't ever want like him to get stuck in this like 60s archetypal thing. It's like he's a person, he has multitudes, he ages, he exists in different ways in different spaces. And then this is um, what I call like an in-camera collage. So I basically like roll up a tube of paper with this space motif printed on it, point that tube at a piece of neon pink paper, and then put my camera in the tube and take a photo and then print out the photo and then cut out a photo of my dad and stick it on that photo. So there's a lot of like material planes happening and then I just like blew it up really huge um, for the piece at SF MoMA so you can almost like walk into that void or that portal with him. And then hanging on top of like the mural are these drawings so you can see like by the pizza that's like the size of the drawings. And the drawings are pencil, as opposed to the powdered graphite, they're like regular pencil, 20 by 16 inches, and they read right here. This one's everything, right now, and forever. All of which are kind of ways of measuring time or ways of measuring space. And then the last element of it is this space-time window tint so it's um, just like a pink window tint application with this text um, cut out in the negative space and depending on like the light and where you know the sun is hitting um, this crazy glow kind of happens and expands into all these different spaces in SF MoMA which felt um, really kind of powerful and a little like transgressive like I was like am I allowed to like cast pink light on like the Felix Gonzalez Torres like I think you would be down with that, so, um, but it just, like, it literally takes up a lot of space um, in a way that was really surprising. Um, and then the last thing that I'm going to leave you guys on is that the Eagle Creek is also coming to SF MoMA to join that piece. Well, they're technically on different floors, but, um, and Madison Moore is going to be coming up to present an amazing, um, performance, lecture, 
on May 4th, which is also a free day at the museum. And we're gonna do like eight different programs from May 22nd to May 11th. So I know there's no bullet train yet, but if you find yourself in the Bay Area, um, definitely come through and have a drink and like experience, you know, what, um, what it's like to be in this kind of like time traveling bar of the past and future that's also in a museum, but also is an art, but it's also like a family function um, and also will be serving drinks. Um, so that is an invitation and also a conclusion. And thank you. <laughs>